Peter Dale Scott, who's with me today, has just finished writing a book, The War Conspiracy, which is just about to be published on the 15th of this month, and it's subtitled The Secret Road to the Second Indochina War. And it's an account of many of the intrigues that have led to not only the Vietnam War, but other wars in Indochina or other parts of that war. And it touches on the Korean War. And it is a one of the first in-depth studies of many of the connections, both inside the government to different government agencies and to business, that are involved in the causes of the wars in Laos and and in Vietnam. Peter, has your view of what the causes of the Vietnam War changed as you've written this book over the last three years? Well, it certainly broadened and opened out. I, I began by being interested in intelligence agencies and in what I thought was uh, a dangerous centralization of power in that you have not only the power to report on what's happening out there, but also through operations, the, the power actually to, to generate political actions out there, to topple governments through coup d'etat, and uh, on occasion to foment guerrilla uh, wars in remote areas like northeastern Laos and so on. So that was my focus at the beginning, was to look at intelligence operations, particularly on the operations side. Um, and since then, um, I, w I was very interested in the Tonkin Gulf incident, for example. R strictly, the book grew out of a, a depth, an in-depth study of the Tonkin Gulf incident where you had a a destroyer on an intelligence mission, the, the, the Maddox. You had uh, 34A operations, these South Vietnamese swift boats, which were attacking the islands off North Vietnam at the same time. You had unmarked planes flying in, Air America planes flying in from Laos or Thailand to bomb villages in that area of North Vietnam at the same time. All of this was intelligence. And then finally, the, the importance of the uh, radio intercepts, which were used to convince the Washington administration that a second Tonkin Gulf incident had in fact occurred. You know that there's, there's quite a dispute as to whether there really was a second Tonkin Gulf incident, which was the occasion for the first bombing of North Vietnam. And I think Senator Fulbright has now concluded there wasn't a second Tonkin Gulf incident. And yet you had these radio intercepts from the intelligence personnel which proved that there was a second incident. So that was the kind of problem that I was interested in at the beginning. But it's such a complex story, and I apologize to the reader for the complexity of the story, that you find it opening out to involve economic interests, the, uh, in the remnants of the Guomindang, Chiang Kai-shek's uh, uh, sort of, not so much within Taiwan, but the connections he had with uh, or overseas Chinese communities throughout Southeast Asia and so I on. I think w one of the things that intrigued me most about the book was the picture of the war conspiracy as, at least some of the time, a conspiracy by some elements of government against others. Yes, I and believe. I believe that is the case. And the, the uh, is it accurate to say, do you think, that not only are the intelligence activities the trigger, but things are so sensitive, the, the content of one radio telegram can determine whether something is an attack or a defensive reaction, say, as in the, the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, that that intelligence really plays a, a, a balanced role. Of, uh, that's not quite the right word for yes. it. Oh, yes. And that, that therefore their contact, as you document with Air America, with, with narcotics, with the Gomendang, are are much more important than the weight of any one intercorporate lock might suggest because of the very um, borderline position that intelligence plays? Yes, I, I would add to that that I think they're particularly important at what you might call critical periods. You, you, you reach a point where the government is at an impasse and there, you, you have a faction and incidentally you get often have intelligence people in, in both factions. Not all intelligence operators are hawks. That, that's not the conclusion of my book. Uh, but you have an impasse in the government. We, you know, let's say that the, the government of South Vietnam is not working. It's maybe about to fall. There are some people who say uh, we've got to escalate to reassure the people in Saigon that we're serious. You also have some other people, and these may include some intelligence people, who are saying it's time to cut our losses and, and find out some way to get out of there. And it's in these moments of impasse where the government is at loggerheads with itself that the control over information becomes the control how, over policy. How was that operative in the Tonkin Gulf situation? What? Well, I think it was operative really from the middle of 1963 right through to early 65 in that 
um, there was very there was still resistance in Washington to the idea of bombing North Vietnam, particularly the idea of bombing North Vietnam without any visible provocation, and particularly, of course, in an election year. That was, uh, Johnson was all set to run as the peace candidate in 1964, so it's understandable that all kinds of people were reluctant to bomb North Vietnam at that time, and I think that the administration was pushed into bombing North Vietnam by the, uh, what the are control the of information before and also the control of information after the alleged What, what are the forces that, that did that and how did they operate? Well, my, my what I'm trying to do in the book is not so much to identify the criminal as to demonstrate the existence of the crime. Many, there are many people who will believe that the Tonkin Gulf thing was a mess, that it was confused, that it was... It, they'll even concede that there was no t second Tonkin Gulf incident, but they'll, there's a whole book written this way that suggests it was an unfortunate accident and proves the difficulty of controlling the massive Pentagon. And uh, I'm suggest suggesting that it was no accident. But you're asking me to identify who the man oh, was. Oh, I didn't mean <laughs> it in that sense. I was thinking of, for instance, it, you argue in the, in the book that uh, two of the cables, which yes. were crucial cables, were in fact not relevant to the second Gulf of Tonkin incident. They were in some way held over from the first. Is that, is that yeah, accurate? That's true. Well, that's not my discovery. That's from a very useful book by Anthony Austin called The President's War. And... Uh, he, I think, shows pretty conclusively in that book that the intercepts that were used to force the government to retaliate to the second Tonkin Gulf incident were, in fact, uh, they, they, they were, in a sense, true, except that they were information not about the second incident on August 4th, but about the first incident on August 2nd. And, uh, to which it had already been decided not to have a, a retaliatory right. yes, quite, action yes, against the North States. Yes, and, and that these... Uh, well, I, I would, uh, if you're, at, you, you know, if we're asking who done it, so to speak, I, I, I am very interested that radio intercept information, a special kind of uh, intercept activity, was the responsibility of the Army Security Agency in South Vietnam. We know that from the Pentagon Papers, and when. Uh, when we see that uh, radio intercepts played a, a vital and, and very dubious role, not only in the Tonkin Gulf incidents, but also in other episodes, the, the Cambodia invasion, for example, in 1970, you had another of these impasses over Cambodia. And there were people arguing, including some intelligence people, arguing very strongly that uh, there was no need for the United States to go into Cambodia. Uh, and, uh, in fact... Uh, the issue was where where the whole sort of Viet Cong apparatus had its headquarters, and the and the army was claiming that there was a concrete bastion, a sort of Pentagon building for the other side, in Cambodia, and uh, the, some of the civilians were arguing that there was no such thing, that that just was a, a radical misunderstanding of how the NLF operates, and I believe the, the civilians were right in this, and the New York Times actually printed a map in April 1970 proving that whatever headquarters there was was not in Cambodia but was in South Vietnam. And those people were over... This is what I call an intelligence battle, where you have intelligence operators each trying to uh, influence policy by presenting their version of the facts. And uh, the civilians were overruled by the hard evidence that came from the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the form of radio intercepts that proved that there was this kind of fortress somewhere in Cambodia, and of course the American troops went in, to, went right to where the, the army claimed the fortress was, and it turned out not to exist. So once again, you had the, the hard evidence in the form of intercepts, uh, but, but no, cor no, no correlative to it in, in reality. In, in the situations like the Tonkin Gulf thing, what, what's the interest of whoever is, is on the side of, of provocation in that, say, in that case? Um, seems to me you suggest that that has to do a lot with Laos, say, at the time of Tonkin. Oh, yes. And, yes, yes. and also with the, the long-standing interest of Air America and the CIA in Laos. Could, can you explain that more? Uh, well, it's, hard, it's very hard to do that in terms of one single incident, but in terms of the whole of 1964, it, was, uh, it, it served the interests of many different factions, not all of them American. We must remember, for example, that the Guomindang was still thinking and still publicly talking about invading mainland China. And in fact, uh, 
the, the Guomindang said, I think, that 19, for, they said for some years that 1963 would be the crucial year. And um, I might mention about the Tonkin Gulf incident, for example, that there were Chi nationalist Chinese on those little patrol boats that I was talking about. There may have been more Chinese than Vietnamese, for all I know, that it may well have been Chinese pilots that flew the Air America planes that bombed the villages. It may even have been, uh, I, the, here I'm, I'm only speculating, the other two things are, are more, corrobor uh, more corroborated, but it, it may be that the Americans were using Chinese personnel to translate from Vietnamese for them because there was a great shortage of uh, experts in the Vietnamese languages for the radio intercepts. So that uh, they had a stake, there are obviously, you have to remember that uh, the, the powerful financial influences in Vientiane, Laos, for example, are mostly Chinese, that, uh, uh, that the, the Asian uh, capitalist population of Saigon is mostly Chinese in Cholon in the district, and this, something like this is true also in Bangkok and Singapore well, What and business so is, does the CIA have getting involved with? I mean, what's, their, what's the route? Well, it's we go back to the impossible. 50s uh, when, uh, America, you know, the, the McCarthy era and America had uh, accommodated to the loss of mainland China, but this produced among liberals almost more than among conservatives the, the determination to make a stand in Southeast Asia on the mainland. And that meant, unfortunately, working with very reactionary elements, the, the only sort of uh, visible opposition at that time that they could work with was the status quo, which was quite corrupt, which was thoroughly sort of intermingled with opium in that area. The French had relied on the, the sort of de facto power networks which were set up by the narcotics trade in opium, and the, the CIA inherited this and took it over, and, and I argue in my chapter on heroin, not only took it over, but actually helped build it up that the, uh, the source of opium from mainland China had been cut off by the, the communists. You had a, a worldwide opium network reaching to America, reaching to Chinatown uh, tongs here, right here in America, secret societies. But the, the, the opium had been cut off, and this was, of course, a crisis to the opium industry, and the, the, the CIA allowed its resources to be used via its airline, its, quote, private airline in... Uh, in Southeast Asia, we call it Air America today. It was called Civil Air Transport in those days. It's the it's, the, it's uh, uh, General Chenault's airline that he set up after World War II. Uh, they allowed that airline, which had uh, was sixty percent controlled by the Nationalist Chinese and was based in Taiwan. They allowed it to fly in supplies and even cash, CIA cash, to the opium growers and traders, uh, the the so-called. Guomindang remnants in northern Thailand and Burma. What did the CIA get out of it? Well, it got out of it a, a network which reached, which reached through the whole of Southeast Asia. It, uh, it got out of it, particularly in the early 50s, reinforcement for the elements in Malaya that were putting down the insurrection there, because these were mostly so-called triads or secret societies, uh, uh, Chinese, overseas Chinese with links to the Guomindang, who were actually hired as private armies by the mine owners and in Malaya to put down the insurrection there. And the British started off by trying to stamp out narcotics in Malaya, but they found that this meant crushing the secret societies. And as a very scholarly book points out, this created a vacuum, which the communists moved into. So the British learned that they had to hold off from this. And meanwhile, the, the CIA indirectly, but I think quite consciously, uh, were allowing their resources to be used to build it up. You have to remember that opium was reaching this country in the form of heroin. So that they're essentially they were rather callously trading an increase in heroin use throughout the world for right-wing political support for their rollback strategy in Southeast Asia. I mean, is that a containment or rollback? rollback. I think some of them were rollbacks. It's, it's a more right-wing picture of the CIA than I certainly have in general. I think of them. Well, I really don't want... Uh, I think that uh, it's very easy to um, to oversimplify what I'm saying about the CIA there. I think there were, yes, particularly in the Far East. They, they, a lot of them were right-wing and set up links with the extreme right-wing, uh, particularly in the form of a, of a Guomindang apparatus, which incidentally I think also had links to the right-wing Galen apparatus in Germany, which the, the CIA also worked with. 
However, the CIA also contained liberals, and we must remember that some of those OSS veterans, you know, had worked with Ho Chi Minh and so on. And particularly when, when Lansdale went out to Indochina, for example, in 1955, I'm just trying to be fair here, mm -hmm. he did, uh, one of the first things he did was try to crush the, uh, the, the opium network in Cholon, the Chinese suburb of Saigon, which the French intelligence had used as a kind of control mechanism for, for Indochina. And uh, Lansdale won the battle in 1955, but I think he lost the war because it, three or four years later it was necessary for the Xiem regime to restore its links with that network in order to survive, and that's what uh, it is said. I'm making you know unprovable charges here, but it, it frequently it has been claimed that Madame Nu was involved in that, that Madame Qi was involved in that, and... Uh, and most and, and many top level people in the Sa present Saigon administration, including General Kim's brother. Do you think that that uh, right wing element in the CIA, or that with ties to the Gomendang and to narcotics traffic, continues today to operate? We're talking about a period '64 at Tonkin, which is now seven years ago, eight years ago. Uh, it's it's hard for me to analyze it that way because I just don't have the evidence. But what I would say is that certain devices which uh, were perfected over the years for generating incidents, for generating coups, for generating a kind of crisis uh, to which the American government had to respond because the sort of intelligence personnel had deliberately made a mess that the, then the military had to come in and, and deal with. Uh, those devices are still practiced, and I suppose... Th uh, I'll give you two very recent instances. Both relate to my book. Well, the first one would be Cambodia. You remember there was a coup in Cambodia which preceded the invasion. And many people said what madness this coup was because the only uh, sort of possible stable government there was, which was that of Prince Norodom Sihanouk, had now been overthrown. And then th the, By a the more right-wing... Yes, Ellen, l yes, right, Lon, Lon Nol and uh, Son Nok Tang, who's the, now the premier and who is the man with the longest links to the CIA in that area, and a man whose efforts to overthrow Sihanouk had been subsidized by the CIA for, for years. Uh, and this new sort of very weak government went right out and sort of uh, attacked uh, the... Uh, the uh, troops of the NLF that had taken refuge in along the eastern border of Cambodia. And people said, what madness, how insane, because they can't possibly win against those people. But of course, it wasn't madness, it wasn't insane. It was a way of generating a crisis which would force the Americans to intervene to, to back them up. And uh, this has been tried so many times and has worked so many times that it was perfectly rational for the Cambodians to expect that it would work in the case of Cambodia in 1970. And then most recently, there's been this talk about General Lavelle, who was uh, flying these unauthorized attacks against North Vietnam, which were then quite falsely called pr protective reaction raids. And just la was, I think it was just last week, uh, Jack Anderson ran a column in which he said, it's not the first time this has happened, that something very like this uh, he, he first of all points out that it was uh, General Lavelle was doing this in the context of Kissinger's efforts to make some kind of secret deal with the Vietnamese in Paris, and uh, that uh, it was just like in 1967 when Obrak and Markovich, who were two friends of Kissinger, were on a secret mission to Vietnam, and the Joint Chiefs or the or Sync Pack dumped a sort of record number of bombs all around Hanoi while they were doing this. I uh, of course and that, are, that meant even saving up all their authorizations to bomb, didn't right. it? They could use them all at once. Uh, and uh, I have a whole chapter about this in my book. Of course, I didn't know about the General Lavelle thing. I wrote it before the General Lavelle episode, in fact. But uh, precisely what Jack Anderson is talking about in 1967, I have uh, a whole chapter about how we not only bombed Hanoi, but actually bombed Soviet ships in Haiphong Harbor, bombed Chinese ships, and that these attacks on Soviet and Chinese shipping occurred regularly at times when there were secret peace uh, negotiations going on. Uh, with the, the uh, through and, the Russian and, do they and Chinese. Do they fail to occur when there weren't 
secret negotiations. There's such a high on. degree of correlation. It's just fantastic that even when you have a Polish peace initiative, that the, a Polish ship gets attacked. I mean, that's the degree of refinement to which this really hideous kind of uh, thing was going on. I can't prove that that was the intention, but I can draw a little chart, and I have, which is two pages long, of uh, of attacks on shipping which correlate very closely with the peace initiatives at the time. Do Can I say one no. more word about that? And that is that, although we didn't know it at the time, uh, there were periods when Haiphong Harbor was off limits because of these sensitive peace negotiations, and you find that the, n the greatest number of attacks on shipping are precisely at times when ha Hanoi and Haiphong have been put secretly off limits. It seems to me we're talking about a series, not just one war conspiracy in the narrow sense, but many different ones. I mean, we've just talked of two, of one of elements of the CIA conspiring against... I call it a syndrome, right? A syndrome, right, yes. conspiring against the military. Here we're talking about uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff perhaps conspiring against Hen Henry Kissinger, I mean, or, or the... Yes, the I, think a bit, I, I think, remember, it's not quite that disparate because I think the intention of a lot of the right CIA people was precisely to elevate out of a covert operation into a military operation so that their interests and those of the military did coincide. Oh, they may have coincided. I just meant mm. that they were not necessarily in communication with each other. It's uh, At least yes. if they were, you weren't, you weren't talking about I that. can't see that. I can only see the outward manifestations. Right. Well, <laughs> it, it seems to me I have a, in terms of the present situation, is it, uh, there's obviously this struggle continuing, as General Lavelle's actions indicate, between the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the withdrawal policy. And Kissinger, I And say, yes. Kissinger, mm -hmm. if you want to say. And, and Nixon seems more to be connected to Kissinger. I mean, it would hard, be hard to I see. I think in an election year, the presidents are usually on the side of the negotiators, yes. Right. And uh, who do you think is winning that uh, war of nerves? Well, there's a short-term answer to that and a long-term answer to that. Um, I think in the the long term, we have never yet seen a successful de-escalation uh, of this war. And I fear even in the long term, even if Vietnamization were to work, I think the whole way in which it was set out by Nixon, the way that he always specified that withdrawal of the troops did not apply to the troops on the aircraft carriers and the troops in Thailand and so on. It does not mean a withdrawal from the war. It just means that he wants to win or at least to maintain U.S. presence by other means. I think it is... See, I start going... I go all the way back to 1959 and I talk about what were then not military operations but essentially in covert intelligence activities, and I think it's very important to go that far back and look at those, because that is a situation where you did not have the military in the scene, you only had the intelligence plus Air America in the scene, and that is possibly what we might have in 73, 74, if Nixon wins the election, and I think it will, uh, it will represent a continuation of the American presence by other means. I'm not at all sanguine about the ability to get the United States out of right. Vietnam. And I want to rem remind everyone that it means more than getting the troops out. It means more than getting the planes out. It means that we're no longer going to try and arrange coups, topple governments, and, and, and push people around the way we have been doing for over 20 years. This, the situation that comes to my mind is the situation of the French in Algeria where the fight between de Gaulle and the right-wing military was yes. very severe and right. led and at not, times to... And not all, altogether unrelated, may I say. All right. Well, maybe you should say some more about <laughs> that in a second. But, but it, at times it threatened the, the stability of the central government in France itself. Yes. And the jockeying from de Gaulle's point of view in order to disengage from Algeria was, was very extreme. Now, I don't mean to imply that, therefore, I think Nixon is the de Gaulle. I'd... Obviously, I don't think that. But it seems to me that there is evidence of a great deal of jockeying in yes. order simply to affect the withdrawal of ground yes. troops. Right. And my, my temptation, knowing much less than you do about this, is to see, for instance, the promotion of Abrams to the Joint Chiefs of Staff as an attempt 
by Nixon to solidify the troop withdrawal position inside the Joint Chiefs, who have been, mm -hmm. I think, on the Lavelle side of this right. controversy. Yes. Do you think that's a reasonable... I think that I, those are very sensible uh, words you've put in at this point. And, uh, of course, no analogy is perfect in history, but I think the, com the, the suggestion you raised about comparing the, the predicament of Nixon to the predicament of de Gaulle is, is a very apt one, and, and one which should indeed be thought about. And, of course, the, the trouble that de Gaulle had with his generals and with the secret army, which emerged ultimately, uh, uh, we should think about all of that. Uh, it's, it's not easy, I think, for most Americans to think of their domestic history in terms of such, you know, we, we've become in, accustomed over the last decade to think of uh, very insidious things going on in, in Indochina, I think most of us still have this feeling it can't happen here, you know, I mean, because what we see when we look around us is, 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 is much more attractive than that uh, from, from and most a, And much America more seemingly ever. stable. Right, yes, but um, uh, I'm, I'm not going to give you a, a, a sort of three-minute summary of what's going to happen to this country in the next year, but I, I do think that th there are very powerful forces opposed to even what Nixon proposes to do, which you might say is a, is a rather conservative kind of withdrawal program, and uh, I think you're absolutely right. When uh, Kissinger is running into a lot of trouble, I think Nixon in uh, 72, at any rate, will be in a position rather like Johnson in 64, where uh, he was not in a hurry to, to, to do hawk-like things, and yet there were people who, for that very reason, started chivying and pushing him harder than usual, uh, is usually the case. Uh, the difference you're suggesting, or one of the principal differences between... Nixon and de Gaulle is that de Gaulle's long-range intent was a very low profile in Algeria, and that Nixon's intent here is, is, is you would argue, is to really to shift the the mechanism of conducting the war in Southeast Asia. Is that no? That that brings us to a whole aspect of the book that we haven't even talked about, which is economic interests. I think de Gaulle's long-term object, uh, object was uh, by a political change of policy to maintain. French economic links with the natural resources, particularly the natural gas of, of Algeria. Which we have and just purchased in uh, very large quantities. Right. Uh, I, I th yes. Well, we, we don't have time for all of that. All right. But uh, I think that uh, American intelligence operations, including uh, and Nixon's uh, Vietnamization proposals and Nixon doctrine and so on, also have to do with U.S. interest in long-term relationship to the resources of Indochina, which increasingly, it appears, uh, despite many protestations to the contrary, it appears uh, that the oil industry suspect that there's a considerable amount of oil in the offshore areas of Indochina, and that there's one place where they're, I think they're just about ready to drill, uh, which is in a offshore area which uh, is claimed by South Vietnam, but which is embarrassingly close to Cambodia. In fact, if it weren't for the, the odd kinks in the, uh, in the, the boundary, uh, you would think that they were part of Cambodian uh, waters rather than Vietnamese waters. And uh, the, there, some people have claimed that the resources in that South China Sea along the Sunda Shelf May some t it, uh, it may sometime be an area which will be comparable to the Persian Gulf. It may, in fact, be one of the l largest untapped oil re uh, reserves areas of the world. And we know that in the time of increasing talk about, you know, the the need for long-term planning for, for, for energy resources, that this, this sort of area can be extremely important. I think that the... Um, that one can make a military case for having gone into Cambodia in 1970, but one can also make a case that one wanted at least to secure those offshore uh, waters for the 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 uh, for the for the development of uh, of the oil. And I think it's quite easy to show that the people who uh, among if you look starting at the start looking at the the Vietnam lobby in this country, the pe the private interests that have been pushing for the same sort of thing that these intelligence agents have been pushing for, we find the, the oil lobby. We find a, a man called William Henderson in 1963, for example, uh, edits a book and writes a chapter in which he says, in effect, we have to go beyond these covert operations that we've been using in the past. We have to intervene. We've always been intervening, he says, but we have to intervene more in forthrightly. In yes. Uh, but we must intervene more frankly and directly than we have been intervening before. This was uh, a message to the Kennedy administration. 
Um, and uh, so uh, I think most people know that there are very strong, uh, a very high interface between the oil industry and intelligence operations overseas. And uh, I think that oil interests have been uh, clearly, I think, been interested in uh, Indochina at least since about 1963. And in fact, I haven't checked this out yet, but I noticed that among the American friends of Vietnam at a conference in 1958, uh, an organization called Offshore Services uh, was represented way back then. And there are, there are a lot of small, not proven, but, but sort of hints that, that, that uh, the possibility of offshore oil was uh, people in the inside were aware of it back before the Second Vietnam War ever really began, and that they, like the Pan Am officials that you talk about, also yes. in the book and see it, it right. he were involved in the war in this hair trigger relationship through intelligence, yes. being able to determine what right. ma- much larger forces did. Okay. Well, we're. Uh, out of time, and uh, I'm sorry about that. It's been very interesting talking to you. I've been talking to Peter Dale Scott about his book, The War Conspiracy, The Secret Road to the Second Indochina War, which is about to be published by Bob Merrill. It's uh, been a pleasure, and I hope you're going to keep up this kind of research in the future. Thanks very much.